Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be here today with three experts in the field of animal agriculture and its exit hopefully from our culture. Um, J. Morris Hicks is the author of Outcry. Glenn Merzer is the author of Food is Climate. And Sile Rao is the founder and executive director of Climate Healers. And I'm Dale Walkinen, um, executive director of Facing Future. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, we want to go look at the, the big picture of uh, agriculture and what it's doing for the climate. It's something that's often ignored in the, um, in the big climate debates for some reason. Not even John Kerry seems to really understand the role of animal agriculture. Uh, so, you know, while we focus on feeding seaweed to cows, uh, the whole of our land is being wasted. So maybe we can just talk about what's the big picture in terms of agriculture. Well, the big picture is land use. Yes. Land use is um, the, the number one fact. I mean, consider that uh, more than one third of the earth is being dedicated to grazing land. And according to Silish's paper, um, if all that, if, if even 41% of that land were to be restored to forest, uh, we would be sequestering enough carbon to uh, get back to a sustainable world. In addition to that, there are the oceans, 70% of the Earth's surface, which uh, are dying and which if we didn't have industrial fishing uh, would be part of the solution, would be uh, um, the, uh, such an effective carbon sink and generating oxygen for the planet and healing the planet. Apparently the phytoplankton is the critical element and also the, um, the whales, which actually sequester more carbon than the rainforest. Is that <laughs> actually true? I'm not up on that statistic, so let okay. me know if anyone else is. I don't well, know. they certainly circulate the, the water. And, what you know, the whales do those. is they, they circulate the cool waters from the bottom of the ocean to the top. Um, the, the whale poop hmm. is, is, a, is a source of nutrients for the phytoplankton, so it's helpful for, to have a robust phytoplankton population. The phytoplankton emit a chemical called dimethyl sulfide, which rises in the atmosphere, bonds with water droplets, and forms clouds. The clouds help cool the oceans, which in turn is good for the phytoplankton. Uh, so that would be a positive feedback loop. If we had a healthy whale population, healthy phytoplankton population, more cloud cover, more fish in the ocean, that, and all we have to do to create that is leave the oceans alone. Just stop the industrial fishing. Yeah, fundamentally, we are dealing with a self-healing system. You know, uh, Earth is a health self-healing system, and she's been doing great. A sad part of the big picture for me is the fact that all of these non, all these environmental NGOs out there, they claim to be. Uh, helping to preserve our biosphere that gives us life. Yet none of them tell us about the, the, uh, the requirement that we, we, we need to be eating plant-based foods. In fact, they never mention it. And I, I happened to be in a discussion uh, about eight years ago with two of the CEOs from the very large NGOs. And the host of that meeting in front of 25 people said, you know, I've been on you guys' website and there's nothing in there about uh, animal-based foods and, and its impact on climate change. And he says, why is it not there? You both know it's the number one cause. And they were friends of his. And so he asked one of them and he kind of hemmed and hawed a bit. And then he said, well, if we became known as anti-meat, it would kill our fundraising. Now to me, that, that is borderline criminal. Forbes magazine has an article um, that is talking about animal agriculture pretty frankly, actually. And it's, I was surprised that they were, they allowed that to, to be published, but it's good. It shows that the dam is bursting. 
you know it's because it's a process but i mean imagine if we had been having climate change 400 years ago or 300 years ago when we didn't understand uh, the physics and chemistry and biology of the oceans and the and land and uh, and the earth uh, we would all been attributing this to supernatural forces right now at least we know that it's basically physics chemistry and biology with a bit of randomness thrown in so we know that we need to be looking at the science of this carefully and we know what to do the leading cause of climate change is actually animal agriculture which is rather shocking and i think this has been shown in several documentaries and certainly in your papers so the ipcc has a convention that you only start counting from 1750 onwards and i'm saying well that misleads you if you start counting from 10000 years back you will realize that animal agriculture has done more damage has had more emissions into the atmosphere than fossil fuels ever did and that's documented evidence the scientifically documented evidence and also we know that uh, fossil fuels and the burning machine uh, has this faustian bargain associated with it as jim hansen puts it which is that it puts a whole bunch of aerosols into the atmosphere that are really cooling the atmosphere you know to, so they it's shielding about one third of the uh, emissions one third of the impact of uh, our co2 emissions so therefore if you only focus on the burning machine from an engineering perspective it is it's actually um monumentally stupid i mean I, i don't know of any other way to say it as an engineer i would fire you if you didn't consider the killing machine right i mean you would be incompetent because if you shut down animal agriculture it will reduce emissions by 87% at least well i think glen in your book you pointed out that sahara desert which was the cradle of civilization uh was actually uh once of lush green area and when we started agriculture and grazing uh we don't exactly know what happened in history but we know that now it's a desert right um there's an image of a nasa fire map on the front cover of my book the red you see are pasture maintenance fires and you notice that for the most part the red brushes up against the margins of the desert pasture maintenance fires um send carbon into the atmosphere they're used to remove any vegetation that the cows and the sheep don't eat on an annual basis so they're they're degrading the land they're sending carbon into the atmosphere and they're apparently not monitored and not quantified in terms of how much damage they do because they they are absurdly viewed as being part of the natural carbon cycle but there's nothing natural about it um and uh the brown that you see here is of course all the deserts from the sahara to the deserts of the middle east to the thar desert in northern india to the gobi desert in china and we all look at this map and we're not surprised because all our lives we've seen images of the deserts uh and where they're located but we know that those areas were forested and we know when they were forested they were forested in the last 10,000 years now we've had forests on the earth for hundreds of millions of years um so if the sahara was forested until less than 10,000 years ago It, it, it's it's a blink of the eye in, in geological time that it's turned into desert and so you have to ask yourself well, what happened in the last 10,000 years and what happened in the last 10,000 years was the invention of agriculture and uh, animal husbandry and pasture maintenance fires and so clearly humans created this now they may have had some help with the wobble of the earth's axis and other external factors i'm not saying it was only one factor but clearly animal agriculture was a large reason for the creation of these deserts i was surprised to learn that there are more cows in india of all places than in any other country uh i assume that's from the dairy uh cuz i don't think that uh 
meat is a large part of the Indian diet, but I don't know. Maybe Salish, you have more wisdom. Yeah, it's uh, mainly from dairy, and it's also a source of uh, foreign exchange for India because uh, beef is one of the largest exports from India. Uh, so, unfortunately, this is how uh, forests are turned into money, you know, and used to, um, to grow the economy, so to speak. Because basically, you know, you graze animals in the forest or clear the forest if necessary and graze animals. And the animals are now converting the biomass into money, into their bodies, right? Their fleshes flesh and it's being chopped up and sold to people. And so this is how they convert um, vegetation into cash. And that's the system we have inherited. Uh, it's basically a game we are playing, you know, the game of money. Mm -hmm. And the game of money is really, you know, if you think about it, it's, uh, it's foundational to what is going on, right? You're kind of stuck in that game. And as long as we, um, you know, um, treat other beings as objects that we can turn into money, we are going to keep doing this. I was once a lobbyist for the ASPCA uh, and compassion was the issue, not a great seller in Albany where I was working. Mm -hmm. um, but now I feel like, my God, if people could just understand this very simple thing that animal agriculture is using the land and the water uh, and we are going to need that land and water um, and that we've wiped out the wildlife in order to provide for our food animals. It's an appalling tragedy. Absolutely. You know, it's an appalling tragedy, but it's also an, a wonderful opportunity. When you look at uh, how we can solve climate change, it's sitting right there in front of us. You know, you can address it. So this is why we formulate these things as, you know, if you were to solve this problem, how would you do it? And make it obvious to people that any student, you know, any, anyone who's taking engineering should be able to solve this problem, to understand that uh, addressing animal agriculture is foundational to any solution to climate change, right? Right. Jim, you pointed out in your book that it takes 10 times the amount of land and resources to uh, produce meat for 15% of our calories as it would be to produce food directly for people? Yeah, I, I talk about that all the time, and I don't think I'm getting through to very many people. Uh, one of my favorite scientists of all time is Dr. James Lovelock, who's now 102, and he was one of the nine big picture scientists featured in Outcry, and I can't tell from any of his writing that he is on board with, with the fact that as you say, animal agriculture on a per calorie basis is over 10 times as much land, water, and energy as plant-based foods. So it led me to conclude that if we cannot take the animal out of the equation when it comes to feeding ourselves, we will never learn to live in harmony with nature, thereby placing the future of our civilization and our species in serious jeopardy so that begs the question, why don't more people get it? And I think it's the protein myth, which mm -hmm. I kind of coined this as I call it locked brain syndrome. And I think maybe even James Lovelock and other esteemed people that I have great respect for may be suffering from that syndrome. It's because of the mistaken yet almost ubiquitous belief that humans actually need to eat animal protein to be healthy a host of incredibly powerful plant-based solutions to the world's most serious health, hunger, and environmental crises never even make it to the table for consideration. And, and the, the world's greens, the NGOs, they don't even talk about it. Well, we also know that our SAD, our standard American diet is producing heart disease, cancer, diabetes, it's making people sick. We have enormous medical costs. And yet we persist in, in the myth that somehow this animal protein is good for us or healthy for us, which it clearly is not. It, it, it's nonsense, you know, the idea of animal protein. It's, it's pure fabrication. 
Um, T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study, proved that plant protein is superior to animal protein. And the, the, the need for protein in the human body is very, very small. Um, uh, human babies get in breast milk, and who needs more protein than a growing infant, right? But they get in breast milk 5% breast milk of their calories from protein. So we don't need more than 5% of our calories from protein. And you could get that very easily from virtually any human food, vegetables, fruits, um, uh, legumes, mushrooms, uh, whole grains. So uh, there, there are the, the number of people in the United States who are not suffering from hunger, but are suffering from a protein deficiency is zero. There's nobody in a hospital in America who has enough food, has enough calories, and is suffering from protein deficiency. It's a non-existent problem. Um, so it's just nonsense. It's just propaganda. You know, the animal industry has to tout their product. So their product is high in protein, which is a bad thing because the excess protein stresses the kidneys and their protein is carcinogenic. But since they're high in protein, they've made it, they've tried to turn it into a positive by telling us that we need as much protein as we can get. Uh, much the way the dairy industry makes it sound like all we need is more and more calcium. And obviously the cows get their protein and their calcium from the plants that they eat. So uh, it's just nonsense. And I, I, I don't understand why anybody believes it anymore. I want to step in and say part of the problem, and maybe a large part of our problem, is industry looks to our schools of nutrition. For Cornell, for example. Now, I served on T. Colin Campbell's board of directors of his foundation for six years. I got to know him and his family very well. I've been in the room when, when he has been mistreated by his own beloved Cornell University. And I can tell you what, they have done their best to make his life miserable. Uh, since he began writing about the, the, the problems with animal protein, particularly with cancer. And, and as such, there has never been a clinical trial to test his lab findings in humans about the easily reversible or preventable cancer. So it, it is a cry and shame what has happened to him. Uh, he's, he kind of shrugs it off and you know he knows he's telling the truth and doing the right thing, but uh, they made it they made it uh, such that his message could not be heard clearly around the world. Had they adopted his science and urged other universities to do similar studies and get to the bottom of this cancer issue, you know, they made, that was 40 years ago when he was absolutely certain about his findings in the lab. They just have never been a clinical trial for humans. So where would we be if Cornell had listened and encouraged other universities to study the same thing, search for the truth, the physics, the chemistry, and the biology of nutrition. Well, one of the truths that's in front of us now, of course, is the zoonotic diseases, um, of which we have quite a few because of our interaction with animals, our, our uh, transgression into habitat, and our actual eating of animals um, has caused things like HIV, Ebola, probably COVID, and on and on, on SARS. <laughs> this is so obvious. Uh, we, we've, we know that we've also wiped out 70% of the wildlife since 1970, a shocking statistic in order to provide for our food animals. Um, so, you know, that in itself should be screaming at us, should be in all the headlines uh, of our minds. I'm looking at, at a graph. You mentioned the, uh, the biodiversity. This is a graph that I got from uh, Corey Bradshaw, professor at Flinders University in Australia. And he, I saw one, a short video and he was just ranting about how horrible it is that we are losing such biodiversity. And he has this graph that he uses that shows 10,000 years ago, 100% of the vertebrate ant land animals were wild. 100%, 10,000, we were barely even emerging. And now humans alone are, 
con uh, comprise a greater amount of land mass than do all wild animals. Cattle is uh, comprised more than all other animals put together. And now wild animals are down to like 4% of the, of the weight of the biomass of vertebrate animals in the world. And that's driving all sorts of um, extinction of other species. It's, it's just criminal. Well, the other thing is that we're also, animal agriculture is tremendously polluting, <laughs> destroying our rivers, uh, destroying our uh, estuaries, destroying our soil, um, all the manure from animals. It, we have a sewer system, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So you, you, maybe you put it on the land, but it's not the same as when you have a simple cow pie and a very small operation. It's a large amount of stuff that is much more dangerous. We're getting things like E. coli uh, from, I think it's chickens primarily, because of our, we don't know what to do with the waste. And there's tremendous amount of waste. Uh, one cow produces, I don't know how many tons of waste in a year. And all of that goes into our environment. And the media always does a, a very poor job of covering this because it seems like once or twice a year, we'll get a story that there's E. coli in romaine lettuce or E. coli in tomatoes or something. Now, E. coli comes from the colon of animals. There's no colon in lettuce or tomatoes. So why don't they tell the truth when they report this story? Yes, E. coli was found in lettuce and that's because the lettuce is downstream of a pig farm or a cattle farm or a chicken farm. So it, you know, it's the problem, even when the problem seems to be a vegetable, the problem is really animal foods. All the problems we have from climate emergency to pandemics, to the health crisis, to the fact that we spend something like 18% of our gross national product on health and on medicines, uh, uh, water pollution, air pollution, every single problem seems to come from animal agriculture. And for some reason, they keep resisting the obvious change that we have to make. And the media is all but complicit in, in, uh, in this conspiracy of not letting the truth out. They don't, you know, I think sometimes it, it's, it's media networks not wanting to offend their advertisers. And sometimes I just think it's laziness. They don't want to, you know, they're not taking the time to uncover the truth. But it's, it's absurd to report on E. coli and lettuce without saying where it came from. Well, and also the other thing is we've, we've used all these pesticides and fertilizers to grow corn, to grow food crops, uh, soy, for cows <laughs> and pigs. And that has degraded our land with, the, with monoculture in, in a tremendous way. We could feed very many more. We could feed 14 people on a, on a vegetarian diet for every one who's on a major meat diet. Uh, we could, and the land is drying up. You know, look at the West of America, it's drying up. Even up in Canada, which they thought they would be safe, they're having to sell their cattle because the drought is, they can't water them, they can't feed them. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Silas Rao a question. Uh, can you explain what is gonna have to happen for you to meet, us to meet your target of 20, is it 2026 for the vegan world? How's that gonna happen? <laughs> yeah, um, this is a, uh, this is a grassroots movement that we are triggering, okay? So the way grassroots movements work, I mean, I recall back in 2005, having dinner with someone who was a very respected man, and he told me, oh, gay marriage will never happen. You know, look at what they're doing in San Francisco, men getting married to men, how, how horrible that is, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I told him, hey, my, my colleague is gay. I don't see why he shouldn't have a normal life compared to any one of us. Right. And, um, but then, you know, it was, it was considered so out of the pale. This is just so outside the norm that it'll never happen. And within 10 years, it was a law of the land. So that's how fast 
um, social justice issues can change. Okay, so I see this as an exponential transformation. So it's basically what we are doing when we talk, when we uh, create programs like this, is that we are poking holes in the dam. So we are actually punching holes in the dam. And there are lots of us punching holes in the dam. And the dam is now slowly, the water is coming out, you know, more and more people are seeing it. And eventually it bursts. Now, it's very hard to predict when it will burst, but there are some indicators as to how fast you need to be growing a movement before it bursts and becomes, becomes normal. Normal meaning that is now the new norm. The, those who are opposing gay marriage are now in the minority, right? And they are sort of increasingly marginalized in community. In, in the same way, it will be, it will burst, and then you will have veganism as the normal, and those who are eating animals or treating animals badly or abusing animals will be in the minority. So it's not a question of making veganism uh, socially acceptable. It's making animal abuse socially unacceptable. Glenn turned me on to that movie, Seaspiracy, which I just thought was fantastic. I want to talk about uh, the, the ocean uh, cruelty to animals, Glenn? Well, the, the image that stayed with me from that film was how they catch dolphins in these mile wide nets that they throw into the sea. But they're not trying to catch dolphin uh, for the meat, at least. They don't uh, eat, uh, eat dolphin, apparently. Uh, but what they do is when they catch the dolphins, they, they slice them up, kill them, and throw them back into the sea. Now, why would they do that if they don't want to eat them? And the answer is that the dolphins are competing with them for the tuna and the other fish. So that monumental cruelty and it's suicidal cruelty, because if we extract all life from the sea, that's not going to be good for, for human beings either. Um, so uh, I recommend that documentary to everyone. And uh, we have to realize that all we have to do to solve this problem is have some respect for the Earth. The Earth, as Silas was saying earlier, is a self-healing mechanism. And the earth can solve this climate crisis a lot better than we humans can. I know we're proud of our devices like smart thermostats, but smart thermostats aren't going to do it. Right. Uh, the earth can do it, but only if it's left alone. You know, if you go to the doctor and you have a wound, uh, the doctor is never going to say, well, that just keeps scraping it every day. No. <laughs> The, the doctor may dress it, but then he'll say, or she'll say, leave it alone. Um, so what we have to do is leave enough of the earth alone and it will heal. So then, then the question becomes, well, how do you leave the earth alone? We have, we have our cities, we, you know, we have our infrastructure, we have our lives. How do you leave the earth alone? And you start with the oceans, 70% of the earth. They could effectively be left alone just by not eating fish. We don't eat fish. That ends industrial sh um, fishing. There'll still be some ships, some pleasure craft on the oceans, but they don't do near the harm that the industrial fishing does. So we could leave 70% of the earth alone by not eating fish. And then if we don't eat meat, that's more, well more than another third of the land of the earth because there's the grazing land and then there's all the land that's wasted to grow food for the animals. So you've got more than 80% of the earth that we can leave alone just by not eating meat. We could enjoy the other 20% of the earth. So I noticed in the Forbes article about uh, Salish's paper, uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, cumulative deforestation. Mm -hmm. You showed that picture of the Sahara Desert and I was thinking about the, de the cumulative deforestation, you included the S Sahara, right, in your, in your paper, Silesh? Yeah, the cumulative deforestation starting from 8,000 years back, um, we have caused more greenhouse gas emissions than all fossil fuel sources combined. 
just you know from 8000 years back to the industrial revolution so if you include beyond the industrial revolution it's almost double right. so that we have caused double the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from deforestation than from all fossil fuel sources combined and that gives us the opportunity to reverse climate change if you bring back the forest that we cut and you ask why can't we bring back the forest that we cut um, well because we are eating animals you know that's the reason why you are not able to do that so if you stop eating animals we get healthy and we have now the land to go bring back the forest that we cut and therefore reverse climate change and so all of our problems you know you will see there is nothing that does not improve when you shut down this killing machine right. when you shut down this animal agriculture industry because to me you know we are lamenting that the world is dying around us the earth is dying around us and yet we have a killing machine that we have started that's killing like trillions of animals every year you know trillions of wild animals and you know 80 billion land animals every year and we want to keep growing that and i said that doesn't make any sense whatsoever doesn't make any sense from from a common sense perspective let alone science okay when you see scientists not talking about it and i go to a scientific convention like the american geophysical unions and i discover that they are uh, serving steak as the main course mm -hmm. it just boggles my mind how scientists can continue to pretend to be scientists when they don't do this you know it's it's almost like it's uh, it's it's I don't know. I mean, it is self-evident stuff, right? That we are not seeing, and uh, and I think we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Well, it'll be interesting to see how the COP, the Conference of Parties in Glasgow, copes with this issue. Whether they uh, present it, I was very happy to see that um, video by Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. uh, where she is talking about animal agriculture in such a coherent and beautiful way. And that was embedded in the Forbes article. That yep. was really yep. heartwarming to see. Okay. Uh, and there, there is a there is a move to say to the cop, why are we having serving animals <laughs> at the at the cafeterias at the conference of parties that's dealing with climate change when we know that serving and eating animals is a major part of the climate crisis. Well. Um, thank you all for this very lively and informative conversation. It's so important that people understand uh, the role of animal agriculture in the crisis that we're facing. And I appreciate especially that your book, uh, Glenn, has half recipes. Uh, <laughs> we can do it. It's right. wonderful. <laughs> uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Dale.